Good morning. Um, I guess let's begin in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day. Um, we just praise you for the opportunity to gather and the opportunity to hear your word. I, I pray that you would speak through me, Lord. Um, I pray that your spirit would proclaim the message that you desire. I pray that you would illuminate the scriptures to us as we read, um, that the message that you have given in your word that has abided for thousands of years now would continue to ring fresh and powerful and able to change and to save. And I pray that uh, anything that I say that is untrue or unhelpful would be banished from, from thought as we leave this place and that only that which is true to your word and true to your purposes, Lord, would remain and that it would be a blessing on the congregation. And so we just ask your blessing and that in all things that you would be glorified, Lord, and that as we leave here, that we would be in awe of our God and everything that you have done. In your name, amen. So I want to focus today on Romans 8, 1 through 11. But Romans is a letter, and every part of that letter is important. You can't take Romans 8 and ignore Romans 9 through 11. You can't ignore the application in Romans 12 through 15, and you can't ignore the, the messages and, and the strings of thought that Paul brings to bear throughout Romans 1 through 7 and hope to actually understand what he's getting at. It's one connected progression of thought. Um, and so today, time is constraining me and I have one message. And so this is not going to be an in-depth study. Um, we're going to be reading many passages of scripture and past multitudes of pastors throughout the ages have preached sermons on every single one of these sections of scripture. In fact, they've probably preached multiple sermons on some of them, breaking them into greater. So I know hiking, so I'm going to relate this to hiking a mountain. Um, we're not going to examine every little tree and flower and pretty rock along the way. We, we'd be here for days. Um, rather, this is going to be more of like a, uh, a route overview that you read on the internet that gives you the main points. And then we're going to look at pictures along the way so that as you hopefully go back and read Romans afresh, that you will know that as you go through these packs, this as you go through the book, you're going to have those pictures that tell you, ah, I'm here along the route. I'm here along this progression of thought. And it'll give us a perspective on the whole book that will make the individual portions that we read more applicable. Um, so that's my hope as we go through the sermon. So necessarily, um, my elaboration is going to be restrained due to the time, and uh, I'm not going to be able to say as much as I would like on, on most of the sections, but I hope that we find this encouraging and helpful to understand the overall progression of Romans um, as it relates to the gospel. And so we're going to dive right in, and we're going to start at Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Um, and I'm going to be progressing pretty much linearly through the book. So if you want to have, if you have your Bible, if you just open to Romans 1.1, 1, 1, it'll be pretty easy to follow me through with this as we read snippets of section. Um, so as we read Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you... Among among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Now this next section says to all who are in Rome, but this book 
is written such that we can replace that with to all who are in Liberty Bible Church, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is laying out here a very succinct summary of the gospel. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born of the seed of David, fulfilling the promises of God in the Old Testament, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection is the proof that the ultimate proof of his divinity and his his kingship that was bestowed on him as he rose from the dead, conquering death. And Paul, his purpose in writing this, as he goes on to explain, is that he has wanted to come to Rome, and as he says in verse 15, so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. That is the purpose of this entire epistle, is to proclaim the gospel. And it takes him 15 chapters to proclaim the gospel. Um, and that, that's the whole book. So all of it, all of it is the gospel. Um, so we can't, we can't pick and choose which parts of Romans we like or don't like. It is all one. Um, and so as we begin, like I said, I'm, uh, I know hiking. So Paul begins his journey, um, and we can look at this as we are ascending a mountain peak. And uh, we, can, we can use Mount Ogden as an example. I'm sure we've all looked up at Mount Ogden. And you have the high summit that has the radio towers. And then there's Allen Peak on the side. And most mountains will have multiple peaks, even though there's maybe one summit higher than the rest. And uh, Paul in, in Romans we have two peaks, one at the end of Romans 8 and then one at the end of Romans 11. And so we're going to ascend those peaks, but we're going to start in the valley of sin and death. And we're going to climb to those summits and then we're going to drop down the backside into the valley of life and peace in the Holy Spirit on the backside. Um, and I think that's actually a, a good example of how Paul's progression of thought begins. And so you begin at the trailhead in the valley of sin and death, and you begin hiking through the dark forest of human depravity. Um, and I think it's important as we begin to have in, in mind the main idea um, of, of what our hope and what the gospel tells us. And it's that the Holy Spirit in dwelling believers ensures their eternal salvation and provides the power for mortification and sanctification. This is assured on the basis of Jesus Christ's resurrection and demands that we offer our lives as living sacrifices by the Holy Spirit's enablement in response. So we're going to keep that in mind. That's that's what we're moving towards, and that's what we're trying to see that Paul is developing throughout Romans. And so he begins with this question, why do Christians need the Holy Spirit to live in them? As Kelly read in, in Romans 8, 1 through 11 for us, Paul's focus is on those who walk according to the Spirit. Why is that necessary? Well, because as we see initially, there is a pervasive depravity to natural man. Um, the problem is believers live in corrupt bodies in a corrupt world. And this is shown, he, he develops this idea in Romans 1 for the Gentiles, in Romans 2 for the Jews. And then in Romans 3, we read, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. That's Romans 3, 9. And then in Romans 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. Some translations helpfully have, they have become altogether worthless. 
There is none who does good. There is no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Under the uh, Calvinist and the uh, acronym TULIP for the doctrines of grace. T stands for total depravity, which can, is, is true, but it can be misunderstood nowadays that man is not as evil as he could be. There is always new depths to the depravity that man can explore, but man is pervasively depraved. Every single part of us, our speech, our thoughts, our actions, are sinful. Every thought of our heart is not turned towards glorifying God in our natural state. It is seeking our own glory, our autonomy, our free will. Um, and that is rebellion against God. And so that's where Paul begins, is an honest assessment of our state apart from God. We are rebels and sinners deserving of judgment. But then, as we're hiking, we've begun hiking in the darkness, but now the sun begins to break over the horizon and the sunrise comes and we read of God's propitiation for us in sending Jesus Christ. And in Romans 3.24, we read, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Sorry, I just remembered I have, an app, I have a handout. You guys just want to take one and pass it back. Um, I've got definitions listed on the handout for propitiation and some of the other statements, but um, propitiation means that God, Christ, paid the debt. He's, he fulfilled all that God required in payment for sin. And as such we no longer are under condemnation because Christ paid it all. Um, and, and in this passage, it tells us that God did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Meaning that in the Old Testament, though the sacrifices um, offered the Jews believed that they received forgiveness and they did from God in response to the sacrifices, but it was a forgiveness that was given and based on the fact that there would be a full and final payment offered in Jesus Christ. That's what the Old Testament Jews looked forward to, and we as Christians now in the church look back. All the sins that we commit, even the sins that we have yet to commit, Christ paid on the cross. All of, all of the sins for all of the elect of God were stored up and poured out on Christ in one moment. Um, I, I can't elaborate on this, and, and I, words cannot express what Christ bore on the cross. But if you can think of all of the guilt that you have ever felt in your life, all of the shame at your sinful actions, and then think of the millions of believers now and throughout time, and think of everything, all of that, and all of the, all of the sin that we aren't even aware of, that we transgress God's law, all of that was borne by Christ on the cross. Um, and it was done, as he said, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So in light of that, we see that we move to Romans 4, and in Romans 4, 9 through 12, we see that this propitiation is valid for both Jew and Gentile. 
that it's not just God's chosen people, the, the nation of Israel that Christ died for, but he died even for us who are not of the lineage of Abraham by birth, but we have become of the lineage of Abraham by faith in Christ. And so he says, does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all who believe. Though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. And in Romans 4.16, he makes clear that it is of faith alone. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And finally, in Romans 5, he, he elaborates that this propitiation of Christ has brought us peace with God. Because Christ has paid the debt, because Christ has paid everything, we no longer are enemies of God. And it is by his grace alone. And Romans 5, 6 through 11 says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So Christ paid our debt through his death, and then he has bought us reconciliation through his life. Through the resurrection, we now have hope that Christ didn't just pay our debt at one point and then say, good, your sins are wiped away. Now go out and do good. Don't mess up again because I'm not doing this again. Um, that, that's, not the, that's not the grace of God. His grace is sufficient to save. And so Christ, in his resurrection, begins to impute life to us. His righteousness is accounted to us so that it's no lo- we don't need to fear death and condemnation anymore. Our, our peace with God is eternally secured because Christ lives again and sits at the right hand of God. And so we have this glorious news that Paul proclaims from Romans 3.24 through Romans 5. And then as a result, in light of this immense love of God, this unfathomable, we we can never, we can't even begin to scratch the surface really of just what this means. Um, But Paul says that we then have an obligation as a result. Paul God did not save us so that we could continue in our sin. He saved us that we could return to our original purpose to do the will of God. And so in Romans 6, we read that Paul puts this in very powerful language, that we are slaves of God. Our wills are not to be our own. Because God has redeemed us, we have the obligation to live righteously according to God's commandments. And so in Romans 6, verse 11, we read, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Um, Some translations say, let it never be. 
Do you know, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves, slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? So we see that what we do with our lives declares our true allegiance. Lip service is not enough to declare and to show God who we truly serve. It has to be lived out. And yet, Paul then moves on from this as we continue to climb higher and we come to a jagged section on the mountain. We come to boulders and brambles and the going gets hard because we find that there is a battle within. The flesh wars against us and we're unable by our own strength to live out this obligation to live for God. And Paul, in in the strongest language, and some commentators will say that Romans 7 is too powerful for the Christian's experience. That it's too powerful of an expression of remaining sin that it can't be for the Christian. It has to be for the unregenerate Jew. Yet I will say that any Christian who is truly honest will admit that every single day they find that Paul's words and the, the situation Paul's describe, Paul describes has to be for our life. Um, in Romans seven nineteen, we read, For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. And so we come to the doorstep of Romans 8, And we find this great, we find in Paul's progression of thought that we were depraved sinners and yet God sent Christ to pay the debt for us and to redeem us. And as a result, we should live lives in accordance to God's commandments. And yet we find that our own flesh battles against us and often overcomes us when we seek to do this in our own power. We find that we are powerless to follow the commands of God, even though in our own mind we desire to. And the world will tell us it, it, it is everywhere, and we heard about it in Sunday school, that, oh, if you just believe it, if you just have inner peace, if you just, if you just meditate enough, or if you just believe in yourself, you can do it. And, and Paul is saying, no, the flesh, the flesh trumps our own will every time. And so then we come to Romans 8, and we've asked the question, why do we need the Holy Spirit? And this is the answer, because on our own, we're powerless. And so then we come, and we see that there are two parts to this solution. And Paul resummarizes what he said in that Christ has overcome the flesh and the world. And I think I think anyone who reads Paul will understand that um, he doesn't seem to speak linearly in his sentences. We, we as Westerners like to lay out our thoughts and our sentences very linearly. And Paul doesn't do that. He's more like Yoda. Um, he, he's like, Paul backwards speaks sometimes, yes. And I, I mean, if we think about Paul, we read that he was lashed multiple times, stoned multiple times, shipwrecked. I really think Paul probably even moved and sounded like Yoda. He, he'd be moving over, eh, 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 sits down, um, speak to the gospel of you, I will. Um, but as we, as we read this, we're going we're gonna to jump around, not necessarily linearly through Romans 8, But Christ lays out that, first of all, in the solution, Christ's life is our righteousness. And so if we turn to verse 3, the first part, he says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. 
on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. And so in that first section, he says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And just as every part of Romans is necessary, we need to remember that every part of Christ's work of of Jesus being born as a man, living as a man, and then in his ministry, his death and his resurrection, all of that was necessary. The Bible gives us almost no information on the first 30 years of Christ. We have the incarnation, we have the birth of Christ, and then we see Christ when he's 12. We see that he is in the temple, he's aware of his purpose. The, the teachers of the law are astounded at his understanding, even at the age of 12. And yet he humbles himself under his parents, he goes back with them to, to Galilee, and And we hear nothing else of the early life of Christ. And yet those 30 years are not wasted years. Um, In them, Christ was living in full obedience to the law. He was living in full, he was fulfilling all of the righteousness that God required of mankind. Um, And that life, he proved that he overcame the flesh. He never sinned. He endured all the temptations that we do without succumbing. Uh, it was absolutely necessary. And in, in that life, he perfectly modeled walking according to the Spirit. He was led by the will of God. He was led by the will of the Spirit. And he did it all in perfect obedience. And then we read that Christ's death is our payment. And so in the last part of Romans 3, we see that God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That is, Christ died. He had not succumbed to the flesh. He had not succumbed to the warring of the spirit within him. And then he had... In his death, he crucified the flesh on the cross. And so Christ's death is where the flesh and sinful desires and everything else was put to death as well. Um, Some call this Christ's active obedience that his, his life of, that he lived in obedience to the Father and in obedience to the will of God is referred to as the passive obedience of Christ. And then his active obedience was fulfilling the ultimate purpose that he was sent here to do on earth and that he was born to die. He was born to die in our place and he actively submitted himself under it. It wasn't easy. We see in, in Gethsemane and in his prayer before he goes to the cross, He's in such anguish. He's sweating drops of blood. His spirit is torn within him. This wasn't something that was easy for him. This was the hardest thing that a human being has ever done. It truly went against the utter core of who Christ was as a man to submit himself to the cross. And yet he did it. And in doing so, he completely paid the debt for the sin of all the elect and endured the full measure of of God's wrath. Um, and we spoke earlier of that in Romans three twenty five through 26. But that wasn't the end of the story because if that had been the case, then we would know that Christ died and as an innocent, as innocent before the Father, God could have raised his spirit and God, man and God, which were brought together at the incarnation, could have been separated again And then for us, we would still be left with the problem in Romans 7 that our own flesh was not crucified on the cross and that we would be powerless to live for God. But praise God, Christ arose. Um, I purposefully chose that song because we read in Romans 8.2, 
For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And if we skip down to verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be filled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to their flesh set set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. And so Christ's resurrection is our victory. His victory is imputed to those who walk according to the Spirit. Um, Through the life of Christ in us, we are able to overcome that sin in flesh that wars within us. And so that's, that's the great solution. We had the problem that on our own, in our own power, we were powerless to do what God has commanded. But the gospel is that Christ fulfilled all righteousness. He died crucifying the flesh and then he rose again conquering death and holding life in his hand. And he imputes that to everyone who walks according to the spirit. And so Christ we see is our righteousness, our payment and our victory. But we still have, how does that become manifest in our life? How how does that transfer from Christ to us in a tangible way? And that's the second part of the solution. The Holy Spirit comes and lives within us, and he gives us the power to overcome the flesh. Um, And so we read first that because of that, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And in Romans 8, 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And when Paul is using this word, this phrase, in Christ Jesus, it is that those who were indwelt by the Spirit have this, the Holy Spirit is the same Holy Spirit that dwelled in Christ, directed him in his life and raised him from the dead. And that same spirit was poured out and now lives within us. And so we have Christ, we have the spirit of Christ in us, working out through us. And so then we read in verse 9, um, But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. So that's what I was just saying in, in that last section. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. Points back to Romans 8, 6 through 8 which says to be for, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And as we were reading earlier, our natural fallen state is to not do the things of God. And this is why. Because the carnal mind is at war with God. Before, unless the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us and regenerates us, gives us new life, gives us a new mind and a new love for God, we aren't just rebels. We don't just put God aside. We are actively at war with God. Um, And yet Paul says, but you were not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. And that leads to Romans 8, 10, and 11, which I believe is the, the crux of Romans. It is where all, all of his earlier lines of thought, all of his earlier progressions of thought are funneling down and they meet in Romans 8 and they're bound together in these two statements in Romans 8, 10, and 11. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So we see that the Holy Spirit indwelling the believer regenerates their spirit in verse 10, that he makes our spirit alive where it was dead. And then 
we see that the Holy Spirit living within us not only makes our spirit alive for eternal life, but he gives us the power to live for God temporally. He gives us life. He gives us power for life in our present day and state. We're no longer bound to that the desires of the flesh and the overcomings of the flesh when we rely on the spirit because the spirit that was able to raise Jesus from the dead after he bore the full wrath of God, which would rip apart any one of us, that same spirit lives within us and is more than capable of regenerating our flesh and overcoming our individual flesh. Um, and this is, it's just such an amazing thought the, that the power of the Spirit is sufficient and it is evidenced by the resurrection. Um, he says, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. And that is pointing back to the, the triune, um, the threefold workings of God in the resurrection of Christ. God the Father decreed that Christ would go to the cross. And he also sent the Spirit to raise Christ from the dead. Jesus Christ himself offered his life willingly in response and in obedience to God and bore the wrath for sin. And the Holy Spirit does the will of both God and Christ. And he comes and he regenerates us and gives us life. He illumines the, the scriptures to us and gives us a mind that loves God and is no longer at war with God. And this power then, in light of the, the spirit overcoming the flesh, this then brings us back to the obligation that Paul stated in Romans 6. And we read, in, in verse 13 of Romans 8, that for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So if by the Spirit, not relying on our own power, but relying on the Holy Spirit, we engage our flesh in battle and begin to put it to death progressively, we will live. And this is not a... Um, this is not a, a deal that God is making with us. This is not him saying that you have the spirit and now if you do your part, then I'll do mine. And it's conditional on us putting to death the deeds of the body. Paul, Paul is really saying here that um, he's, he's using hypotheticals but he's saying that those who are indwelt by the Spirit will do this. You can't have the Spirit living in you and not actually have it work itself out in the actions of your life. If you are saved and if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, you will see that you start to put to death the deeds of the body. You will have new desires. You will have the desire to please God, to follow his commandments. And even though we stumble, that's not to say we'll never sin again. That, that happens all the time. But it is to say that we will see a trend that we no longer delight in sin we don't, we repent of sin and we realize that it is an affront to God, that it hurts the one who has saved us, who has called us his children, and that in response, we desire, we repent to God, we ask for forgiveness, and then we ask that we, he gives us the power to overcome that. And, and looking back in our life, we will see a progression of that actually happening. Um, and so I, I want to use an illustration here that as we've looked at this, we see that the Holy Spirit, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of my notes. That there's one, one last part that mortification is the negative side of this, putting to death the deeds of the body. But it's not just enough that we put off bad things. It's not enough that we just stop cursing, that we just stop lying and, and cheating and stealing and, and whatever else, but we need to put on Christ. We need to fill those spaces with 
positive things. And so if we look in Romans 8, 17, he says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And in Romans 8, 29, he says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And so we see that our ultimate purpose in being saved is not just to not go to hell, but it's to actually look like Christ and to be conformed into his image. And so back to the illustration, I meant to, I meant to bring an actual physical object, but you're going to have to use your imaginations. Um, if you have a ball on a string and you start to swing it around, we're going to do a little bit of physics. Don't worry, I'm not going to go down the rabbit trail. But there is an action on the ball by the string called centripetal force. Centripetal force means it's a center-seeking force. It's pulling that ball constantly towards the center. And so as you swing, um, your hand is the anchor point. You have the string, and the ball is swinging around. It's moving through space, but it's never flying off randomly because the string is constantly pulling it towards the center all the way around. And that's what it should be like in the Christian life, that Christ is our anchor point, and the Holy Spirit is is the one who holds us. And as we move through life, as we move through all the different spheres of our lives, all the different responsibilities, that if we rely on the Spirit and are led by the Spirit, that we're constantly being pulled towards Christ. But the Bible says that we need to rely on the Holy Spirit for this. If we begin to rely on our own strength, it's as if someone cut the string and then the ball just flies off in whatever direction it would happen to be going at that time. And the same is true of us. When we start to say, I've got this God, I, I think I can handle this on my own, then we, we have... We begin to stray, we begin to float, we begin, begin to fly off into the sins that we didn't want to do and we experience that, that whole section of Romans 7 that we were talking about where the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. That's, that's how this works out in our life. And it, don't take the illustration too far, it's not a perfect illustration. Um, but... Um, we should be reliant just as the ball is reliant on the string to keep it rotating in orbit around the anchor point. Our lives should be reliant on the Holy Spirit and on his power to keep us constantly moving in conformity to Christ. And, and so now we'll move on to application because Paul has made this great statement that we now have life eternally and we have life temporally, and that should work itself out in us living in accordance to God's commandments and seeking to do these things. But every believer has to acknowledge that it's not easy. And I'm not terribly old. Some of you are significantly older than I am, have been running this race a lot longer than I have. But I, I'm beginning to see that it's difficult day after day, year after year, trying to pursue the things of God. And even as our minds are renewed, that just, I imagine that similarly to hiking a mountain, even though I may be 500 feet from the summit and I've already climbed 4,500 feet to get to that point, that last 500 feet looks interminably far away. It, is, it gets harder and harder the more tired that we get. And the more that we live in this life, the more that we see the depravity of man. We see the fallenness of the world. We see our, our own flesh still just doesn't seem to want to die and it becomes more and more difficult. And so we need to continue to rely on the spirit. But Paul gives us this hope that we live in a fallen world and we face trial, but... In Romans 8.18, we read, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And then he moves on, and he begins to develop this thought, and it climaxes in that first peak that I talked about at the beginning of the sermon, at the end of Romans 8, that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit not only makes our soul alive, not only gives us power to live for God in this present time. But he assures 
with no possibility of it ever changing our eternal salvation because the believer and the Holy Spirit cannot be separated. And so we'll read this section, uh, Romans 8, 30 through 39. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Justified means that we are in a... It's a legal term. We're legally standing before God justified, but glorified is the end state that we reach when we get to heaven, that this whole process of sanctification, looking more like Christ in our life, it will be brought to completion. We will be glorified. We will look like Christ. And it is assured. Paul, Paul speaks of this in the, in the past tense as if it's, it's so certain that he, even though it hasn't happened yet for him, he speaks of it as if it's already been done and whom he justified these, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. How amazing is that? That, Jesus Christ, the one who would be the, the person, the judge to point the finger at us and say, you have sinned, you deserve judgment. He's the very one who came and gave his life and paid that debt for us. And so then he will stand there and say, I have already paid their sin. You were forgiven. Enter into heaven. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What a glorious, glorious exaltation is that, that that gives us hope that even though this world is trying, even though we face trials and difficulties and we go through seasons of life, some of which are harder than others, that this truth remains, that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then Paul begins to move on. And like I said, Romans 9 through 11 is not often preached on because it talks, it, Paul really begins to work through the doctrine of election. And he's, he's mentioned it, that whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, whom he justified, these he also glorified. It is God who does the calling, God who does the justifying, God who predestined and God who glorifies. It's not us. It doesn't say, and he who saw those who would accept him decided that they could enter into heaven and he'd do the work for them. No, it says whom he called. And so we don't have time to dive into the depths of election. But suffice it to say that at the end of Romans 11, after we work through that next section of the mountain, we reach the last and highest mountain peak. That, why would the Father send the Son? Why would the Son come as the propitiation for our sin? Why would the Holy Spirit indwell the believer? It is for God's own glory. This is the ultimate purpose of everything that God does. And this should be our purpose as well. As we read in Romans eleven thirty three, 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? For of him... And through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen.
So it's not enough that we just look at the Holy Spirit and we say, thank you, Holy Spirit, that I'm not going to hell. Thank you that you give me power to do good things in my life. I'm so glad that I am not like these other sinners. No, our response and our ultimate purpose as slaves of God needs to be that God's own glory is what drives us. That we seek to glorify God in our actions in serving others, in doing what he commands, not for our own praise or our own exaltation, but that God would be glorified in these things. And then as a result of that, Paul then moves on and gives practical examples of what this looks like in the believer's life. That's Romans 12, 15 through 13. I highly encourage you to go home and read these things. I don't have time to dive into all of it. But it is so important to remember that in Romans 12, 1, he begins, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. These mercies of God are the gift of the Holy Spirit and Christ's propitiation, his work, his life, his death, his resurrection on our behalf. These are the things that we need to keep in mind that when our flesh tells us you should just cut that guy off or you should curse that person out, you should get vengeance, you should do this because you deserve a break. It's not a bad thing to relax, and, and it's not, I mean, the, it was in medieval times, you had the monks who tried to take this to the extreme of utter self-denial, complete separation from the world, everything else, but it, it, it was in their own power that they tried to do these things. And Christ says that I want them to live in the world, but not of the world. And we do that by relying upon the Holy Spirit to, to keep us in that anchor around Christ. As we move throughout life, as we do the responsibilities of parenting, of our work, of enjoying leisure, of going out and doing all these other things that as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10.31, therefore whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. We can, we can redeem every single aspect of our life to be for God's glory. And we remember that he gives us those periods of rest and enjoyment as a good gift from a loving father. Um, and then we need to participate in the process of sanctification. That's, that's, Paul Hull's, that's Paul's whole point throughout Romans 12 through 15, 13, is that he has said that a life that is controlled by the Holy Spirit and that is lived in response to the love of God is lived out in actions. Paul gives us a list of examples of what that looks like. And you have mortifying the flesh, as we read in Romans eight thirteen. by that power, we put off the deeds of the body and we put on Christ. Um, and then in Romans 12, 2, he speaks of the renewing of the mind. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The scriptures are the tool that God has given to renew the mind. In 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17, we read, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so, it also, I love Psalm 119, and Psalm 119, 97 through 104 is, this should be our heart in response to the scriptures. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. 
I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. And finally, we put on Christ. In Romans 13, 14, sorry, Romans 13, 11 through 14, Paul says, and do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. But let us put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. And, and so I, that, is, that is my prayer as we go forth from here, that we would put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. I've given in the handout, um, I've listed some of the breakdowns of ways that we can read Romans 12, um, and through fifteen thirteen, And lastly, I'd just like to say that if you're not a believer, that all of these mercies are conditioned on the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. But if you're not a believer, the Bible makes very clear how that's possible. That those he, he is called will repent of their sin. That you need to admit that you're a sinner and unable to repay your debt, that you, you actually do have a debt to God, that he has created you, he has created the world, and he's laid down righteousness and judgments and commandments that were meant to be followed and that you have not done those things. And as such, you are a debtor to God and that you have deserved nothing but judgment. And yet, the Bible tells us that if we believe all that it teaches us about Jesus Christ, and that God raised him from the dead, and that we confess that Jesus Christ alone is Lord and Savior, then God is is sure to forgive us and to make us his own children. And so, um, if you'd like to speak more about that, there there are other men in the church, and you can come speak to me if, if that is your desire. But let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Um, We thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, Lord, that you have spoken to us. You have revealed yourself to us that in our rebellion, you did not just wipe us away, but you loved us so much that you sent your own son to die on the cross, your only begotten son. And I pray that as we go forth, that we would remember that the gospel is the center of everything that we are that Jesus Christ is the good news. He is the gospel and that we need to rely on him every day. That every day we wake up and we thank you for your mercies. That we thank you for the mercies from of old and the new mercies that you bestow upon us. And I pray that as we go out, that whatever that was said was true and helpful will be written on our hearts and that whatever I may have said that was untrue (laughs) would be forgotten and that um, that we as a congregation would be edified through the reading of your word and that we would have an increased love for you Lord who have loved us who has loved us so much in your name amen